This video will be the first of two parts covering atrial fibrillation, which is the commonest sustained heart rhythm disorder. In part one, we'll cover what atrial fibrillation is, what causes it, how to recognize it, what symptoms patients report, and the complications it can cause. And in the second part, we'll cover how to investigate and treat atrial fibrillation. If you're new here, welcome to the channel where I make regular videos on key cardiology topics to make them easy to understand. And if you've seen any of my videos before, welcome back. Atrial fibrillation, usually just abbreviated to AF, is the commonest sustained heart rhythm disorder, affecting around 1-2% of the general population. Its incidence increases with age, such that the risk of developing AF doubles with each passing decade. It is thought to affect around 10% of those over the age of 80 years. In normal sinus rhythm, an electrical impulse is generated by the sinoatrial node, which is located in the wall of the right atrium at the junction with the superior vena cava, and this impulse spreads across both atria, causing them to contract and push blood into the ventricles. Once the impulse reaches the atrioventricular node, it creates a delay to allow the atria to finish contracting before transmitting the impulse onwards to the ventricles via the his purkinje system. In sinus rhythm, there are regular impulses generated by the sinoatrial node, which result in P waves on the ECG. Every P wave is followed by a QRS complex in a one-to-one -one pattern. In contrast, in atrial fibrillation, there are chaotic electrical signals generated in the atria and the pulmonary veins, which cause fibrillation or tremoring of the atria. They no longer beat in any coordinated fashion and hence do not contribute to ventricular filling significantly. When these chaotic signals reach the AV node, the node transmits them intermittently to the ventricles such that the ventricles contract irregularly. So how can we recognize AF on a 12 lead ECG? This ECG shows normal sinus rhythm there are regular P waves clearly visible, and every P wave is followed by a QRS complex. In contrast, here, there are no visible P waves, and the QRS complexes are irregularly irregular, i.e. there is no pattern to their irregularity, which is the hallmark of atrial fibrillation. Clinical AF is usually diagnosed with a 12 lead ECG, but Holter monitoring or other device monitoring can be used to diagnose AF but generally when at least 30 seconds are captured. Anything less than this is considered subclinical AF. If you're finding this video useful, check out the Murmur Master app, which is live on the iOS app store. It's got hundreds of heart sounds from real patients and great summaries on common cardiac conditions. It's already helped thousands to learn worldwide. So how do we classify AF? We generally classify AF based on how it is presenting in the patient in front of us. First diagnosed AF is where AF is detected newly in a patient not previously known to have AF, regardless of how long they are thought to have had it. Paroxysmal AF is where a patient spontaneously reverts between AF and sinus rhythm without intervention. By definition, they spend less than seven days in AF at a time but usually episodes of AF last a few hours to a few days. Persistent AF is where AF lasts for more than seven days and is not self-terminating. Patients require an intervention to restore sinus rhythm, either electrical or chemical, otherwise they would remain in AF. Permanent AF is where patients remain continuously in AF and the physician and patient have jointly decided that no further attempts will be made to restore sinus rhythm, i.e. we accept that the patient will remain in AF on an ongoing basis. This classification is important as it determines how we approach the management of atrial fibrillation. Now time for a quick question to check your knowledge. A 71-year-old lady presents to the emergency department with palpitations for the last two hours. She says she has been diagnosed with an irregular heartbeat in another hospital but you do not have the records to confirm this. She reports that she gets palpitations every few days that last for around two to three hours and then resolve. Her ECG is below. What type of atrial fibrillation do you think she has? Is it 
first diagnosed AF, paroxysmal AF, persistent AF, or permanent AF. Feel free to pause the video if you want a second to have a think. So this lady has paroxysmal AF. The episodes come and go on their own and last for a period of hours, which is characteristic of paroxysmal AF, or abbreviated PATH. So let's move on to explore the causes of AF. AF has many risk factors. I like to split these up into the following categories to help me remember them. Lifestyle related, systemic causes, and cardiac causes. Many different lifestyle factors play a role in the development of atrial fibrillation. Alcohol consumption increases the risk of AF, both long-term use and acute binging. Alcohol can be directly toxic to the atrial cardiomyocytes and trigger inflammation, which can lead to atrial dilatation and remodeling. Also, it is thought to slow conduction in the atria, which can lead to re-entry circuits that can cause chaotic signals in AF. It can also cause an imbalance in the autonomic nervous system and lead to electrolyte imbalances, both of which are associated with AF. Long-standing hypertension increases AF risk as it causes the ventricles to become stiff and less compliant when the atria are trying to fill them with blood. This causes the atria to stretch due to increased pressure, which can cause atrial dilatation and remodeling. Obesity, that is defined as a BMI of greater or equal to 30 kg per meter squared, increases the risk of AF by a number of mechanisms. Adipose tissue around the heart is thought to be pro-inflammatory and can cause changes in the atria that contribute to the arrhythmogenic substrates of AF. Obesity is also associated with hypertension and other comorbidities such as obstructive sleep apnea. Next, there is an interesting relationship with physical activity. Generally, a sedentary lifestyle increases the risk of AF and moderate physical activity reduces the risk. But there is now quite a lot of evidence that high-performance endurance athletes are thought to have a higher risk of atrial fibrillation compared to the average population, possibly related to hypertrophy of the left ventricle and hence result in left atrial dilatation and remodeling. Finally, caffeine intake has been suggested as a potential trigger, but most research to date actually suggests there is not a direct link with AF for most people. Other lifestyle factors include smoking and the use of illicit drugs, which have a small association with atrial fibrillation. Almost any other cardiac disease increases the risk of AF compared to the general population. These include coronary disease, both acute coronary syndromes and chronic ischemia, valvular heart disease, especially mitral stenosis and regurgitation, as both of these cause increased left atrial pressure and hence left atrial dilatation and remodeling, which is a substrate for AF. Heart failure, myocarditis or pericarditis, cardiomyopathies, especially hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and additionally, those undergoing cardiac surgery or percutaneous intervention are also at increased risk. Finally, there are a number of systemic diseases that can trigger episodes of AF, including acute infections and sepsis, thyrotoxicosis, pulmonary embolism, and electrolyte abnormalities, especially hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. Not all patients with AF have risk factors, but most will have some. An important concept here is that AF begets AF. What do we mean by this? It means that the development of AF is itself a risk factor for further AF. The longer a patient is in AF, the more likely they are to remain in AF or get it again, because AF itself causes changes to the atria that promotes further AF and AF maintenance. This process has recently been termed atrial cardiomyopathy. So what are the symptoms that patients with AF report? Around a third of patients are asymptomatic at any particular time, although overall the majority will get symptoms at some point. Perhaps surprisingly, the most common symptoms attributed to AF are relatively non-specific and include fatigue or tiredness and reduced exercise tolerance. More cardiac-specific symptoms include palpitations, i.e. feeling an irregular and fast fluttering in the chest, shortness of breath, 
chest pain and dizziness. Patients also report a higher prevalence of anxiety and depression than the average population. So what signs are present when examining a patient with AF? The most obvious sign is an irregularly irregular pulse. Here there is no pattern to the irregularity and the pulse volume will be variable, i.e. beats with a longer R to R interval will be more forceful as the LV has had longer to fill. Additionally, AF can be appreciated by auscultation with a stethoscope. Let's have a listen to a patient's heart with AF. However, remember, although the examination is suggestive, AF can only be formally diagnosed with an ECG and not from examination alone. For the final part of this video, let's look at the complications AF is associated with. The most notorious complication is a stroke. AF is associated with a 2.3 times increased relative risk of ischemic stroke. An ischemic stroke is where there is a blockage to the flow of blood to a part of the brain, in contrast to a hemorrhagic stroke, where the primary problem is bleeding of an intracranial vessel. So why does AF increase the risk of an ischemic stroke? AF prevents the normal contraction of the left atrial wall, which can mean that blood stagnates and has a tendency to form a clot or thrombus. In particular, a small outpocketing of the left atrium, called the left atrial appendage, is particularly prone to this phenomenon. If a thrombus builds up here, part of it can break off and embolize into the brain via the left ventricle and then aorta and internal carotid or vertebral arteries. This embolism can then wedge itself in a vessel in the brain, restricting blood flow and causing a stroke. As we'll see in the next video, anticoagulation can reduce the chance of having a stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. Secondly, AF increases the risk of developing heart failure by around five times. Heart failure is where there is an inability of the heart to pump sufficient amounts of blood to the tissues to meet metabolic demand. Although there is a bidirectional and complex relationship between AF and heart failure, we know that those who persistently have fast atrial fibrillation with a heart rate greater than 110 beats per minute are at an increased risk of developing a condition called tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, or tachycardiomyopathy. This essentially reflects the fact that the heart does not like to beat chronically above 110 beats per minute. Fortunately, tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy is often responsive to rate-slowing medications or converting the patient to sinus rhythm. Patients with chronic atrial fibrillation are thought to be at an increased risk of cognitive impairment and dementia by around 1.5 times, especially vascular dementia which might reflect a series of microembolisms or little strokes which are too small to detect clinically otherwise. Finally, patients with AF also have a twofold increased risk of cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. This is due to a combination of the mentioned complications and because patients with AF share many risk factors with other diseases, such as ischemic heart disease, so are an increased risk of coronary events as well. And that was the first part of the Murmur Master Summary on atrial fibrillation. If you enjoyed the video, consider giving a like and subscribing to the channel. It would really help to get this content out to more people like you. See you for part two where I'll cover the investigations and management of atrial fibrillation. Bye for now.